uh, for CSM. And I welcome everyone to, to this tutorial. And with me is Elizabeth Fairclough. She's the meeting coordinator also, also from CGD. Uh, we also have Gokhan Danabashoglu, I'll introduce him in a second. But first I'm gonna give you a, a quick overview of, of the week and, um, and allow you some time for, for any final questions. So again, welcome to ACAR. This is where we would all be if it was in no COVID time. I'm actually sitting in this building right now as we speak. It's actually very smoky today here because of the California wildfires that have been reaching us. So it looks very different than in this picture. I want to remind every, everyone of the NCAR UCAR code of conduct. You've received a link to, to this conduct. I, I hope you had a chance to go through and understand it's a pretty, pretty basic. And it applies to everyone, including the in addition to the attendees, the instructors, and all your car staff, and applies to all venues and situations. And please remind that we are all here to learn. And remember that this is a professional environment. If you need any help to report, if you need to report anything inappropriate, please contact myself and Elizabeth. I also want to thank everyone for you know, helping with this, this tutorial, starting with the committee, myself, Alice Duvivier, Cecile Hane, Gunter Ligui, Peter Lawrence, Adam Phillips, and Tim <coughs> Shields. These are all scientists in CGD. And a huge thanks to Elizabeth Faircloth, our logistics person. Uh, education and outreach, we have Valerie Sloan, Jerry Sycone, and Elias Mason, those that attended the pre-tutorial meeting, the welcome and orientation a few weeks ago. You, you've met the three of them and I hope you can practice some of the, the skill that they have shared with you, like the elevator talk, for example, to get to know each other. Computer support is by Davide Del Vento from CISL. We have support from Ryan Johnson. All the helpers and speakers and developers we have up to 60 staff that are involved in this, the preparation of the tutorial, not just from NCAR, but also from, um, from universities and other institutions. And funding from the National Science Foundation. And finally, to all of you for participating in this tutorial. Okay, this is the 2021 CSM tutorial website. I hope all of you are familiar with this website already. I'm posting the URL here, but you, if you just need, if you needed to find it, you just Google 2021 CSM tutorial. I'm listing the tutorial links here. So this is what you'll be seeing when you go to that website. There is a, another link that's not shown here, which is the YouTube um, selection of videos. I recommend following the coursework instead of the YouTube link, because that's a more complete um, set of instructions. And you've got everything that you need in this website. And you, I encourage you to go and browse around if you haven't done so and get familiar with it. We got the agenda, the list of participants, presentations, lab exercise, everything. If you haven't sent already your short bio and photo to Elizabeth, there's still time to do so if you want to be included in the list of participants. So that's this link uh, in the middle here. That's get for you guys to get to know each other, to you know your peers which is very important, like in the future, you know, you, you'll be working on different projects and you might collaborate. And if it was an in-person tutorial, we would, you know, that would happen naturally. But in a virtual world, we need to do an extra effort to get to know each other. The typical day will start at 8.40 a.m. in the morning and, and goes until 10.50 a.m. mountain time. So that's the morning section. Mondays and Fridays is slightly different than the rest of the day. So we start five minutes earlier, Mondays and Fridays. And again, the agenda has all the details. We usually will go start with a quick announcement. On Friday, don't forget that we're gonna have the group of group photo. Everyone should make an effort to join so we can take that photo. And then besides on Monday, which we're gonna have the CSM2 lecture, all the other days we'll start with the Q&A panel session, which is recorded. Then we're gonna have the meet a scientist section, uh, session, which uh, doesn't happen on Monday. 
and and then we're going to get a, a five minute break in, in between these these sessions so that the morning session will have a 15 minute break throughout uh, kind of half away on on that session and then we'll have a lunch time between 10 50 a.m and 12 30 p.m and that's where you have the possibility to meet each other in breakout rooms i'll go in a little bit details on, on what you do and there's a special event that we've created on tuesday and then in the afternoon we have the office hours from 12 30 to 2 30 p.m the morning q a panel session so this is where you're going to ask questions related to, to to the theoretical lectures that you hopefully have already watched it. and we we're going to start those sections with a zoom pulling pulling uh, some like basic quizzes using the zoom pulling feature to ask uh, some basic questions and these will be anonymous so it's just to engage you and those are kind of a general knowledge questions basic questions um, and we will not take too long it's just to you know, do it like an icebreaker um, these sessions will be recorded if you have any questions please raise your, your hand and then ask the question and to, to ask a question and wait for the moderator to give you the floor you also have the option to submit questions beforehand and i i watched that some of you are already doing that which is great these are the links to each of the components i'm going to email back to you again this afternoon you've already got it last week but i will send you another email to remind you of of, of these links and so you can start asking your questions the atm the atmosphere q a which will be right after the session to lecture will close in a, a few minutes before the lecture so if you have your questions ready just you know, type them before we start it all the other ones will start will close 5 p.m mountain time the day before the session. We also have uh, the practical lectures that hopefully you've already went through them, listing from you know, going from Monday through Friday. Each day we are covering a specific topics. I'm listing them here. It's also in, in the agenda in the coursework material. You've got all you know already have the sandbox to be used. You know, most of you are using it. The project accounts, I think most people are, are ready to go. And, and then the Q&A, sorry, the office hours are meant to cover the practical exercise. So if you have any questions related to that, this is where you'll be asking questions. This is not going to be recorded. And again, you raise your hand and then we're going to bring you to a room with a specialist that will help you with your particular question. We, we have the media scientist, which is optional. Thank you for everyone that sent me your, your preferences. This is your time to meet with, with the scientists. There's no agenda and try to obtain the information that you came here looking for. It can be anything related to science, you know, how personal life, how, how, are, how is life as a scientist and anything that you have in mind. And the scientists will be moderating, each science will be moderating the, the session. So it will be kind of an open agenda without a, a specific guideline. I ask you to please don't monopolize the conversation and let everyone to have a turn. And the, the assignments have already been, been done. It's on the coursework for each, each day. So you have to go on the website and then click for each day we have a media scientist section. So click on the scientist bios and then next to the name of the scientist, you see the names of the students that will be meeting with that scientist. So go in and find yours. There are still spot available. If you if you haven't email us your preference, you just now need to go and see. Like we're gonna have a maximum of six students per scientist. So if you see that a particular scientist has four or five, you know you, you can we can still add uh, one or two people. And so just let us know as soon as possible. Then for the lunch activity, that's how you can meet you know, each other and all the participants. We can arrange for you know, breakout rooms if needed, and that's a way for you to networking. It's your space, it's your time, and feel free to have lunch while you're doing so. And then on Tuesday, tomorrow, August 10th, from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Mountain Time, we're going to have an informal conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion in CGD. 
and that's going to be led by Roberta Spivak and Eric Kunzek. They are both from CGD. And this was a request that we got last year, and we decided to include it this year again. So it's an opportunity for you to learn about this topic. If you have any other topic that you'd like to discuss, please let us know and we can try to arrange for that. And then finally, this is the word cloud that we created during the orientation meeting. And we got all the you know, words that people are looking for, expecting from this week learn, climate, hands-on, practice it, and, and so on. And um, I really wish that you know, we, by the end of the week, all of you have accomplished what you can be looking for. And with that, I'm wishing you a productive and successful week. Uh, it's now 8.51 a.m. We're like slightly behind the schedule, but I want to open the floor for any questions related to how the week is going to proceed or anything that you might have in mind before we turn to the CSM2 lecture. Any questions from anybody? Hi. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. But... Oh, that's no worries. Um, you can just call me Harry. I go by Harry. You can also okay. put in the... Harry, thank you. Um, my question was in regards to um, the specialized talks. Um, if we have a question pertaining one of them, how would we go about like clarifying those, particularly the porting issue? Because um, I like you know in, in attempts to like kind of get um, the the community model up running on our home machines. Like if we have a question regarding that, who should we touch base? Yeah, with thank you for asking that. So in that particular one, uh, Brian will be joining one of the the afternoon sessions. So I encourage you to attend that section and then ask directly to, to Brian. I think he will be attending two days, if I'm mistaken. It's Wednesday and Friday. I'll, we can double check. But if for some reason you do not get the opportunity to meet with him on, on that time or you, you will not be able to attend that session, let us know and we can arrange for you to meet with him. And that applies for the other um, specialized talks. If for some reason you don't see you have the opportunity to talk with that person in any of, of the sessions, let, let us know and we can arrange for you to meet with them. Any other questions? If not, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will now pass the ball to Gokan Danakashoglu. So Gokan is a senior scientist in the oceanography section in CGD. His research focuses on understanding the role of the ocean in the Earth's Earth climate system, and is the currently the current CSM chief scientist. And I'll pass the floor to you, Gokan. Thank you, Gustavo. I'm assuming that everybody can see my screen now. So good morning, everybody. Good afternoon or good evening, whatever your time zone is. So it's kind of a weird situation here. This is our second tutorial that we are conducting virtually. So I'll try to provide you a brief, well, relatively brief introduction to the community or system model, that's uh, CESM. And as Gustavo indicated, I'm the uh, chief scientist for CESM. So what I would like to do is uh, just to make sure that everybody is on the same page. And I'm pretty sure that you have enough background for this, but I just wanted to just to briefly introduce what global earth system models are, what they do and what CESM is. Then I'll briefly uh, touch on our efforts, recently completed more or less efforts on coupled model into comparison project phase six, that's CMIP six. Uh, I'll, I think uh, provide majority of the presentation on updates and highlights from some of our ongoing activities and then finish uh, with showing uh, finished by showing a few slides on CESM3, what we are doing towards our next uh, model version. So starting with global earth system models and CESM. So global earth system models essentially represent a virtual laboratory for experimentation. I mean, we can't do these experiments in the actual globe. So this is actually a nice tool. These models uh, represent a very nice tool to provide scientific understanding of past observed events and changes, 
simulating future climate changes and its their impacts, making fu future predictions of climate changes and variability, and finally, uh, providing uh, actionable and societally relevant information, in particular uh, related to perhaps future uh, predictions of Earth's climate and variability. So uh, as many of you likely know, uh, global Earth system models uh, simply use physical equations to simulate key fields and processes in the atmosphere, ocean, land, sea ice, land ice, river runoff, waves, and all, all, the, uh, all the other components that are not necessarily included here. Uh, the, Sorry, oops, I couldn't hear what you said. My watch is <laughs> acting weird. Anyway, the, uh, so all of these equations are actually discretized uh, on a grid. An example is shown here on the upper right uh, on a grid. And this is... Uh, by necessity, and I'll come back to that in a second, uh, they are usually what we call coarse resolution models. Uh, in, in the models that are used in CMIP simulations, that's the couple model intercomparison project that I indicated earlier, they are usually order one degree resolution, meaning that the uh, grid res it is corresponding to about uh, 100 kilometers, 110 kilometers at the equator. So they are necessarily coarse, and many of the processes that are relevant for the climate remain below the grid resolution and they need to be parameterized. And I'm assuming that many of you are familiar with what parameterizations are. They essentially try to represent missing physics in terms of the fields that are explicitly resolved uh, in the model. And those representations essentially build on our understanding of processes from observations or from highly detailed models, uh, such as process models or so-called larger simulations. And we get an idea about their global uh, or broader scale impacts, and then try to essentially represent them in the, in the models using, for example, model resolved temperature or density field, let's say, and the model velocities. And many of the, uh, the, uh, the processes that we try to essentially include in a global Earth system model are schematically shown in this plot here. And they range from snow cover, obviously, to uh, clouds that are quite important. And I'm an oceanographer. Uh, so, of course, the most important component of the climate system is the ocean, joking aside. Uh, we have the marine biology, for example, wind and wave interactions, mixing, and all of these processes tend to be below the grid scale and they need to be parameterized. So, uh, in the, so with this very brief introduction on uh, global earth system models, so CESM essentially is one such model and it is, uh, it, it's at the center of it uh, is the coupler, which essentially uh, provides the uh, venue for information exchange, that'll be state and flux fields between the other uh, component models. And we have the atmosphere, sea ice, land ice, ocean, surface waves, river runoff, and land components. And ocean and land thereby, uh, have their biogeochemical components as well. And then the atmospheric model, for example, we have two component, uh, two versions of it. One is the high top version. And the other one is the regular version or lower top version that we use. And of course, there's chemistry uh, embedded in the atmospheric model uh, as well. So uh, all of the forcings that are related to uh, sort of climate and uh, changes in the climate system, uh, such as greenhouse gases, anthropogenic aerosols, volcanic eruptions that na naturally, they naturally occur, uh, variability in solar incoming radiation, they are all incorporated in the model, and they are essentially incorporated in the entire coupled Earth system uh, through uh, the atmospheric components. These are, uh, these are read in uh, usually as forcing or prescribed data sets in some cases, for example, greenhouse gas concentrations. So uh, this is coming back to what I mean by, by necessity to use coarse resolution models. There, the, uh, Earth system modeling in general involves sort of 
uh, a tag of uh, a tug of war between three sort of uh, endpoints. One is complexity, the other one is the ensemble size, and the other one is the resolution. So I'll just uh, sort of touch upon complexity first. The top two uh, plots here or schematics show increasing complexity of the Earth system models. When uh, the first sort of uh, coupled uh, global modeling started in the uh, sort of mid 1960s, there were really two components, atmosphere and ocean. And of course the atmospheric uh, component included the land sur surface and vegetation uh, information. But as you can see, as we come towards the present, both the component, the component, the, the components that are included in the climate or earth system models increased. We now have, I mean, representation of the sea ice, obviously, river runoff, waves, land ice, and all of the other components. But not only we started adding components to the coupled system, internal or intramodal complexity or intracomponent complexity increased as well. And that's intended to be uh, shown here on the upper uh, right panel with the increasing sort of volume of those uh, cylinders. So atmospheric model component increased tremendously and similarly ocean and sea ice land surface component, uh, their complexity uh, increased. Uh, what I mean by increased complexity, we uh, tend to essentially within the ocean model, for example, we tend to uh, represent uh, more and more uh, essentially uh, things, phenomena or physics that were previously or that have been previously uh, missing. So that's actually uh, one aspect uh, here. Another thing that uh, we are essentially doing throughout the years is increasing the model horizontal and vertical uh, resolution. So this is shown uh, from the atmospheric side here, T42, uh, this is uh, spectral truncation T42 all the way to 340 uh, resolution. And I'll show you more examples of this thing. As the computer power increases, we tend to, as I said, increase the model complexity by adding more uh, model physics or more components, but also we tend to increase the model resolution. And as we try to strive to get more societal relevant information, a general tendency is to go towards higher resolution uh, model simulations. And another aspect uh, here uh, is uh, on the uh, left lower side is we tend to, well, over the, especially over the last 10 years or so, uh, people uh, have realized that we need to really uh, have many ensembles, ensemble realizations of the climate system to get a better understanding of the uncertainties and robustness of certain uh, events. And of course, uh, when you perturb the climate system, then you'll end up essentially with uh, a sort of a spread of uh, solutions. Uh, and uh, CESM, uh, I, I think in my view is one of the pioneers in this uh, uh, arena in the sense that we were one of the first models uh, to produce large ensembles of the climate uh, system. So at the end, essentially, you try to balance model complexity, ensemble size and resolution, and given the resources, computational and human resources that you, uh, that you have, and then you have to also decide on what combination of these things you would like to use based on your scientific question that you are trying to answer. So this is always, this is not an easy thing to do. It's always uh, at the end, uh, a subjective uh, choice made by the scientist or group of uh, scientists. So coming back to again, uh, CESM, uh, CESM is uh, a bottoms up climate modeling approach. And I believe it is the only Earth system modeling framework that involves community. And as, as you know, C stands for community here. Uh, we have 12 working groups and they are given here. Our most recent edition is the working group on Earth system uh, prediction. We have a CSM scientific uh, steering committee that essentially decides on important scientific directions, scientific choices uh, for the CSM. And we have an advisory board that sits on top of all of these 
meeting once a, uh, once a year uh, to provide general guidance and advice uh, to the CSM project. CSM uh, previously, when it started, was called uh, Climate System Model, CSM. Then it changed to Community Climate System Model. And then the latest acronym is CESM. We included the Earth as the Earth System uh, Modeling uh, Framework. So we started uh, about 25 years ago. So we have a lot of experience in model development and its applications. Uh, every year, we have an annual uh, workshop uh, that's generally uh, held uh, in uh, June. And over the last two years, we have been having them uh, virtually. And each working group, well, I shouldn't say each, uh, most of the working groups also have uh, their winter meetings. They generally, uh, uh, so roughly uh, six months uh, to four months away from the uh, CSM annual workshop. So uh, CSM sports a range of, uh, oops, uh, a range of uh, climate science goals through a single code base. Uh, it can be run on single uh, on desktops uh, using, for example, single column versions of the model and in course resolution applications. They can be used, uh, for example, uh, uh, for uh, physics developments, parametrization developments. And a nice example or nice application of this uh, sort of framework is development of, uh, for example, vertical mixing schemes for various component models, which are usually uh, one dimensional uh, in the vertical. Uh, for uh, low resolution and perhaps paleoclimate applications, they can, uh, the model can be run on small clusters and they can be used, uh, for example, uh, for coarse resolution long simulations or coarse resolution short simulations uh, for various science applications. And then uh, at the higher end, what I call HPC uh, class uh, sort of simulations, these can involve what I call medium order one degree resolution models and high resolution uh, order 10 to a degree uh, simulations. They can be run on uh, really uh, uh, high performance computers because they are computationally very expensive, especially as, as you add more components such as ocean biogeochemistry to the system. And these are usually run for CMIP purposes or large ensembles or various uh, sort of breakthrough uh, science uh, simulations. And I should also mention that over the last few years, we have containerized versions of CESM that can be also run on the cloud. So those are also available uh, for the use of the uh, community. Uh, you'll see throughout the uh, tutorial that uh, various combinations of the um, model uh, can be used. Uh, in our default uh, sort of coupled setup, uh, pretty much all of the component models are active. But all of the component models can be also replaced with their data versions. This allows, for example, use of ocean only. Uh, use of the system for ocean-only, ocean sea ice couple, that's what we do a lot for forced hindcast simulations, for example, or land-only or atmosphere-only configurations. Those would be, if you are familiar, AMIP type uh, simulations. The model can be run in aqua planet uh, sort of uh, setting. Uh, there are several atmospheric dynamical cores are available, and I'll be mentioning that thing towards the end of the presentation. And you can also run the model uh, using a slab ocean uh, configuration. There are just too many, perhaps, uh, choices available uh, within each component regarding their parametrizations. And when I uh, mention this thing, I should stress that uh, not all of the options with all the combinations are vetted. I mean, that's, you can imagine, it is a huge task. In our uh, for, uh, sort of uh, scientifically supported configurations, we only uh, essentially test certain settings, certain parameters, and make those things available uh, to the community. But the community is, of course, uh, free to choose whatever combination of these things uh, they would like to use for their own science purposes. And then I should also mention that increasing num we have increasing number of supported component sets and configurations uh, that people uh, can use. So, uh, stepping on uh, to now, we're moving towards couple model into comparison project, phase, phase uh, six or CMIP six uh, efforts. Uh, 
just uh, to remind people uh, what CMIP6 is all about, uh, I have a schematic here from uh, the, one of the CMIP6 papers early on from about five years ago. Uh, the core of the CMIPs uh, involve performing a set of simulations. They are referred to as DEC simulations. It stands for Diagnostic Evaluation and Characterization of uh, Clima. And these simulations involve order 500-year uh, pre-industrial control simulation, a 1% CO2 concentration increase simulation, instantaneous quadrupling of the CO2 simulation, and AMIP, that's the Atmospheric Model Intercomparison Simulation, in which the observed SSDs are used to force an atmosphere-only uh, simulation. So these are the sort of uh, required simulations to be able to participate in uh, CMIP. And I note, uh, I note here that DEC is independent of a specific phase number for CMIP. So the idea is essentially these simulations will, will be used throughout whatever CMIP infinity, uh, uh, and they involve essentially uh, sort of no knowledge or no additional knowledge uh, at that time, forcing knowledge, for example, to be able to run these uh, simulations. The exception is the AMIP simulation that needs to be updated as the CMIP number goes on or goes higher uh, to make it uh, up to uh, present. So then particular CMIP, in this case, CMIP6, around the deck, there we have the CMIP6 historical simulations. Then uh, there are three sets of themes uh, for this CMIP6. Uh, the first theme is systematic biases. The second theme is response to forcing. Those are future scenario simulations. And then the third one is essentially looking into variability, predictability, uh, and again, future scenarios uh, of the system or uh, future, uh, possible, future climate or earth system possibilities. And you can see that then uh, as you get out, uh, go outside of this circle, then it becomes more and more uh, specific and associated with each phenomena that's given here in blue, uh, for example, land use, there are essentially certain model intercomparison projects that go into more into uh, nitty gritty details of these uh, sort of uh, aspects, uh, trying to answer more science-based science uh, questions uh, providing uh, sort of prescriptions for uh, coordinated experiments that can be performed uh, across the uh, globe. And all of these uh, MIPS that are given here in red are the ones that C uh, CESM participated. There are about 20 of them. I should also mention that the total MIP count as of now is I think 35 to 40. And we are actually participating in a few additional MIPS, but SCESM, we did not participate in all the MIPS because some of them were not uh, of interest necessarily to us. We participated with two sets of uh, simulations or config model configurations. The first one is our workhorse, so-called nominal one degree model version, which involves both the low top CAM6 and high top, that's the whole atmosphere community climate model, VACM6 atmospheric model components. We also provided solutions from a second set, which uses slightly coarser resolution for the atmospheric component. That's the two degree uh, version of the atmospheric uh, model. Uh, but otherwise the other components are identical. And this was particularly designed for sort of longer simulations that may be interest uh, to the paleoclimate community. And we uh, primarily performed the deck simulations uh, with this uh, second set. So if you're interested in uh, uh, finding out how our solutions look like or what the model configurations look like, you can take a look at uh, our AGU CSM2 virtual special issue manuscripts. We have 43 uh, manuscripts published so far, and there are still several manuscripts in review. All of these articles are available at both the AGU site and also our site internally from, uh, well, I shouldn't say internally, our CSM website that's also open to uh, public. Uh, the advantage of our site is that it also includes the in-review manuscripts as well, not just the published ones. Uh, the primary manuscript is uh, this particular one that's highlighted here. It's the sort of presenting the overview of the uh, CSM 2 
including a description of the model and highlighting some of the uh, findings. And very recently, well, about mid-March, uh, Jean-Francois uh, Lamarck and uh, I uh, wrote an opinion piece on, uh, in EOS uh, titled Building a Better Model to View Earth's Interacting, uh, interacting Processes. This summarizes, sort of this uh, advertises the uh, papers in this AGU CSM2 virtual special issue. It also summarizes the challenges that we have encountered during this development process and how we overcame them. So if you're interested in uh, uh, reading this short article, uh, that, uh, that may be very uh, useful. So uh, just to uh, sort of uh, summarize our results, uh, what is shown here is a summary of our model performance in comparison to some of the other models that uh, have been submitted to CMIP6 uh, archive. The models that are considered are given uh, here. And then the vertical axis here shows variables as associated with models energy uh, and water cycles, as well as some dynamical uh, fields. And it's considering annual and seasonal timescales, as well as ENSO is included here, and assigning a score based on how well these uh, fields uh, compared to either available observations or relevant available reanalysis products. And uh, the, it's color coded. So for example, the blue fields here, such as precipitation or precipitable water, uh, I believe, uh, are, given, uh, are associated with the water cycle. Energy cycle uh, related fields are given by the orange uh, color. And then the dynamics are given by uh, sort of the purplish uh, color. So in this comparison, you want to have high numbers and also you want to be in the redder uh, or reddish color, uh, uh, reddish color essentially. The bluer ones are doing uh, worse. So this is uh, just showing that essentially uh, the four CSM models that we have, CSM2 is the low top version, CSM2 vacuum is the high top version, and then the other two, CSM2 with FV2 and CSM FV2 are our two degree uh, model versions. And in these metrics, they essentially are, they are in the top 10 of this comparison. So meaning that it's, uh, they are, uh, we are doing uh, which is, uh, rather well in comparison to other uh, submitted models. I should mention that this is as of late last year. So I haven't actually have an updated version of this uh, plot to include uh, comparisons from the newer uh, submissions. So uh, just to mention CSM2 releases, uh, since December 2018, there have been three incremental releases as CSM21X series. Uh, these releases uh, were non-answer changing on purpose. Uh, we wanted to essentially simply in expand the available set of out-of-the-box configurations for readily performing CMIP deck historical and mini MIP tier one simulations for CMIP6 purposes. Uh, then in uh, uh, September, late September of last year, we actually had another release, CSM 2.2 release. And this is, non, uh, this is actually an answer changing release. Uh, it includes uh, many new developments since 2018. And there were also some bug corrections that are also implemented in this version. Uh, I should also mention that this release includes a functional release of MOM6, that's the modular ocean model uh, version six. The new, uh, it'll be the new ocean component in the next version of CESM. And I'll, uh, I'll just provide a quick update uh, on uh, MOM6 uh, at the end of the uh, presentation. And this schematic here, the difference from the previous one, in this one, I've included uh, model versions uh, for each uh, component that we are using in uh, CSM 2.2. Uh, I should also mention that all of our CSM essentially code bases are available uh, through GitHub. So uh, in that sense, the CSM 2 official releases are not very meaningful at this point. It is just uh, serving as sort of milestones in our development process uh, just to keep us on track, essentially. But you can essentially access our newest model versions uh, via GitHub. 
So some updates now and highlights from our ongoing activities. So as I said, uh, CSM uh, was one of the, or is uh, one of the sort of leaders in uh, ensemble uh, simulations. And I'm uh, really happy to uh, convey to you that uh, we have actually created a new ensemble, CSM2 large ensemble. Uh, this was actually performed in collaboration or in partnership with the Institute for Basic Science, that's IBS, Center for Climate Physics, ICCP in short, in Busan, South Korea. We have completed a 100 member ensemble. Uh, this time we are expanding uh, the period of the ensemble simulations uh, from all the way to 1850 to 2100. And SSP 370 scenario uh, was used for the future extensions of these uh, simulations. Uh, I don't want to get into detail uh, of the initial conditions uh, here, but uh, I'll just uh, say that we use the combination of so-called micro and macro initialization approaches. The data sets were released to the community on June 14th, 2021. That's, that's, that was the first day of our CSM uh, uh, annual uh, workshop. I should mention that there are still some missing data sets and we are essentially transferring them from South Korea. The total volume of these data sets is five petabytes and we do not have uh, storage capacity uh, at NCAR to serve all of those data sets. So we'll be serving about one to one and a half petabytes of those data. But if you're interested in uh, getting additional data sets or other data sets, they are, they are available. And you can essentially check our website that will connect you to the South Korean website. And you, you need to fill out a form requesting the data set and those data sets will be available. And the summary or overview manuscript uh, is in review in Earth System uh, Dynamics. And it was led by Keith Rogers from uh, ICCP. Uh, I just wanted to show you a, a highlight from uh, this, these simulations. What is shown here is the seasonal cycle of ensemble and also five-year mean net ecosystem uh, production. So each line here corresponds to a five-year, and in this case, 79-member ensemble mean. The bluish colors refer to earlier periods, starting in 1950, and the reddish colors refer to the later periods. So you can uh, clearly see that with the, uh, inc uh, well, with the warming of the climate, we are seeing essentially an expansion uh, of the uh, seasonal uh, sort of uh, production. Uh, it starts roughly two weeks earlier and ends one week later. This can be also thought of essentially carbon uptake uh, by the system uh, as well. And you can see that the net ecosystem production more than doubles as the climate uh, warms. So I think this is an interesting aspect. And this is discussed in more detail in this manuscript. Another uh, uh, sort of uh, effort that uh, we are pursuing is high resolution simulations with CESM. This is, uh, these simulations are being performed under the umbrella of the International Laboratory for High Resolution Earth System Predictions, that's IHASP. It involves a collaboration between Chinda National Laboratory for Marine Science and Technology, that's QNLM, Texas A&M University, TAMU, and NCAR. So for this particular effort, we are using an older code version, that's CSM 1.3, for various reasons. One reason is simply because we had more experience with this particular model version, and we don't have a high resolution version of the model with CSM 2. So in this case, when I say high resolution, it's essentially quarter degree uh, resolution in the atmosphere and land, and the ocean and sea ice is, are running at a nominal 0.1 degree horizontal resolution. So what do we have? Uh, so all of the, the completed simulations include a 650 year pre-industrial control, an 80 year 1% CO2 increase experiment. We have three members of 1850 to 2100 uh, transient. All high resolution coupled and AMIP simulations are also done. And we have five cycles of the OMIP simulation that's ice ocean uh, coupled and subject to forcing, uh, reanalysis forcing during this period, 1958 to 2018. Ongoing simulations include some decadal prediction simulations for this 1980 to 2018 period. We are extending the 1% CO2 to year 150 
And we, are, we have just started 150 or four times CO2 to complete our deck simulations. By the completion of these 1% uh, and four times CO2 simulations, I believe we'll be the only first and only model in the world to essentially perform these deck simulations at, a, at such a high resolution uh, uh, at a, uh, with a full uh, climate model. So data release, uh, you can check out the IHESP site at Texas A&M University. Uh, on June 12th, we ac actually added additional data sets, released additional data sets. So the PI control is available uh, up to year 500. We have released one transient member and then all high resolution simulations, including their low resolution equivalents are also released to the community. Uh, just to give an idea about other simulations that are being uh, performed, uh, the Earth System uh, Prediction uh, Working Group uh, has been quite busy. Uh, they have essentially started, uh, they have a new set of simulations, so-called seasonal to multi-year large ensemble, that's the SMILE project. Uh, these are new initialized hindcasts using uh, CESM2. Uh, they are performing two-year, 20-member ensembles with four start dates per year for the 1970 to 2018 period. And this is just uh, showing a preliminary result, looking at uh, uh, La Nina skill in comparison to our existing uh, decadal prediction large ensemble. These are for November. Uh, the results from SMILE, the new simulations are on the left side, the older simulations are on the right side, and three La Nina events are considered, 73, 83, and 1998. And these are over a two year period. The black lines in each case uh, represent the observations. This, uh, the thinner red lines are on individual ensemble members and then the solid or thicker red line is the ensemble mean. And you can see visually uh, that the answer or La Nina prediction skill uh, seems to be a lot higher in the new simulations. And this is still under investigations, the reasons why that skill seems to be higher in the new simulations. Uh, they're also performing subseasonal to seasonal hindcasts and real-time forecasts. Uh, for this purpose, they are using 11 member hindcasts set with CSM2 low top version uh, for the 1999-2020 period with weekly starts. And these are relatively short. They are 45 day simulations. Uh, they're also performing high top versions uh, of these predictions, but simply because it's too costly, uh, they are considering only five members and they are doing these simulations only for uh, the winter uh, season. So without going into too much this detail, the bottom plots show the uh, skill or anomaly correlation coefficient in two meter air temperature. The blue, uh, the, the green lines are from our older simulations, CESM1. Uh, the, Yellow, uh, the red lines or reddish lines are from CESM2. Uh, these are all low top model versions. And then the blue uh, column or blue color uh, indicates the CESM2 with the high top version. And just to provide fair comparisons, they are using either five or 10 ensemble members. The bottom line is that uh, in uh, both the global land and North American land uh, sort of uh, correlation skill, uh, the skill with the new model is comparable uh, to, the, uh, to, to the previous model version. And I'm told that actually we are doing uh, quite well compared to uh, other sub-seasonal and seasonal prediction uh, sort of frameworks from other, other uh, groups uh, worldwide. Uh, another actually interesting study that we have just recently completed, and it's actually published now in uh, GRL, is to look at the climate responses to COVID uh, in relation to the Australian uh, bushfire emissions. You may have seen lots of studies recently coming out, uh, primarily focusing on uh, sort of uh, the emissions or changes in emissions associated with COVID. And uh, you can, uh, you probably know that those emission changes did not result in many significant changes or any significant impacts on climate, uh, but if one looks at essentially what's happening with the Australian bushfires and uh, emissions uh, changes related to that, the impacts are much, much larger due to fires. So what we have performed is essentially we have performed uh, a 50 member control. We repeated our control with the actual fire emissions. 
then we imposed essentially emissions changes associated with COVID. And then we added the Australian fire emissions changes, another 50 ensemble members set. So what is shown here is the aerosol optical depth in the top panel. And then the bottom panel shows the top of the atmosphere net shortwave uh, radiation. So the red line is the control with its spread here shown uh, in light gray. The COVID simulation is shown by the blue line here. That's its ensemble mean. I, the spread is omitted here just for sake of uh, sort of clarity. And then the COVID with Australian fire is shown by the green line here, and it's spread is by the dark uh, sort of gray. And you can see a much uh, larger impact of the Australian fires uh, in these, uh, for example, fields, uh, fields, aerosol optical depth, and in particular, top of the net shortwave, top of the atmosphere net shortwave radiation. And these impacts are akin to volcanic uh, eruptions. So uh, we have also enhanced our capabilities with coupled land ice uh, simulations. Uh, just to uh, show uh, and highlight here what they have done, they have performed a 350 year uh, simulation with CESM2. Uh, they increased the CO2 concentration by 1% per year up to quadrupling. And then they kept, it, uh, this, they kept the CO2 levels constant at that quadrupled level uh, for another roughly 200 years. And they were trying to figure out what the impacts are on surface mass balance of increased CO2 emissions. And the plots here are showing the surface mass balance uh, anomalies. Uh, the uh, the pre-industrial control is the one on the left. Middle panel is 20 year average around the CO2 doubling. And then the last panel on the right is the what's happening at the end uh, showing a 20 year mean. Red colors show net accumulation and the blue colors show net ablation. So uh, needless to say, I guess uh, ablation areas expand with increasing CO2. And at the end of uh, uh, 350 years, they are finding that sea level will rise more than uh, one meter and that's cumulative uh, total. We have also a capability now uh, to run the ice sheet model uh, both uh, over Greenland and also Antarctica at the same time. Uh, so we can now support multiple ice sheets and the testing for this uh, feature or capability is underway. Uh, CSM uh, groups, working groups and the community uh, uh, are also performing uh, actionable uh, science or actionable related science. And these are with respect to uh, polar applications. In a collaboration between scientists, indigenous people, and decision-making experts, they are uh, looking to produce and share actionable knowledge to inform, dec inform decisions about the socio-ecological systems in the Arctic and beyond. Another study is looking into uh, sort of impacts of climate change on shipping routes, but in turn, they're also looking at the impacts of uh, those shipping, uh, whatever uh, efforts or shipping routes and their changes on the climate of the Arctic itself. Another interesting study they just started, they are, uh, a group of uh, scientists are looking into Antarctic marine protected areas. Uh, this is a working collaboration with the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, the Southern Ocean Coalition, the Pew Charitable Trust and Sea Legacy. And they are trying to identify biological hotspots and forecast locations of highest ecological value uh, for prediction. Uh, another uh, sort of societally relevant study concerns the impacts of horizontal resolution and chemical complexity. And the focus here is changes in ozone over the continental United States. So what they have done is essentially uh, shown is uh, on the lower left uh, panel, they looked at the impacts of model resolution in representing uh, model chemistry better. So this is using a variable resolution uh, version of the uh, spectral element dynamical core with grid refinement over the continental United States. So you can see that this is the difference between high res 14 kilometer resolution minus sort of our regular one degree resolution. You can see essentially enhanced ozone concentration over particularly urban areas. And I'm told that actually this is an improvement uh, in, in, this, uh, in, its, in its representation. And then the lower right panel is showing the impacts of increased chemical complexity. 
so this is uh, the difference of complex chemistry minus simpler chemistry using the 14 kilometer model version. And you can see that with complex chemistry, we are seeing generally reduction in the ozone concentration. And apparently this is also something positive because uh, with the simpler chemistry, uh, we were seeing actually a positive bias. So that positive bias is eliminated. Uh, the bottom line here is that uh, both the increased resolution and increased complexity uh, is helping essentially improve our representation of ozone uh, in the coupled system. Another uh, sort of effort uh, that we are pursuing uh, is the variable resolution grids. These are all uh, based on the spectral element dynamical core of the atmospheric model, and they are pretty much all done with our university community uh, collaborators. Over the past year or so, we have created uh, and hence uh, sort of all of these versions of the model with grid refinement over the Arctic, uh, Greenland in particular in the lower uh, left panel here over Antarctica, continental US that I showed an example from, uh, North Atlantic, Himalayas, and we are just working on the South American grid. And the fine grid resolution is in these cases is as fine as one eighth or one sixteenth of a degree. Uh, another uh, uh, sort of we think effort that we think is going to result in something very useful uh, for the community is streamlining our coupled and simplified modeling uh, efforts within CESM. One thing that we have done is created a CESM configuration uh, tool. So in this case, rather than uh, a, it's a GUI interface and a user essentially can uh, create a new case simply by clicking a few buttons uh, in a GUI interface. So in this example, if one is interested in running year 2000 conditions, then when you click on that, then uh, the interface is going to tell you what available configurations are available for each model component. And then you can also choose uh, available and compatible physics options for each component. Uh, the, it is still a prototype. We still have a few things to figure out before making this uh, sort of nice tool available uh, to the community. Another uh, effort that we are pursuing uh, is uh, concerning compression techniques for our data sets. We are extremely mindful of our storage footprint. When we do all these experiments, CSM to large ensemble, CMIP simulations, we create a lot of data and uh, we are pursuing essentially how much we can compress them. Uh, we are already using lossless compression, but it's only uh, providing a certain uh, level of uh, sort of storage savings. So in collaboration with our colleagues from CISL and also from uh, Colorado School of Mines, we are looking into lossy compression techniques. So we know that application of lossy compression applied to climate data sets can result in large amount of data reduction with minimal drawbacks. Uh, optimal compression settings uh, can be determined and our colleagues essentially created some tools uh, to, uh, for this purpose. And we are essentially now looking through how much essentially we can compress without loss of uh, sort of information for our purposes. And this is particularly important that we do not lose information as we look into extremes, climate extremes, for example, precipitation and other stuff. And we are, we are trying to be carefully, uh, we are trying to carefully evaluate the level of compression that we can afford. And just uh, a few slides on uh, future of CSM. Uh, uh, and we are working towards creation of our next model version. And uh, one of the efforts that we are pursuing uh, concerns vertical resolution, increased vertical resolution for our workhorse uh, model. The motivation here is to improve the representation of the stratosphere and boundary layer in our standard model for climate applications. And uh, we know that increased resolution improves uh, representations of, for example, QBO, stratospheric polar vortex, boundary layer clouds and moisture and temperature profiles, just to uh, list a few. Uh, we are uh, so far, uh, we, are, uh, we have more or less settled on 91 vertical levels. This is uh, 
You can compare this thing uh, to our standard 32 mo uh, level model version uh, with 80 kilometers, uh, uh, with the model top at 80 kilometers. We will also create another sort of half top version at 40 kilometers with 58 uh, vertical levels. Uh, we've converged on 500 meter grid spacing in the free troposphere and lower uh, stratosphere as shown uh, in the schematic uh, here. And we'll be including 10 additional levels within the surface boundary layer. And uh, we are essentially uh, working on tuning uh, of this particular model version using the lower top uh, version. Another thing uh, is uh, the, uh, concerns atmospheric dynamical core evaluation. Uh, again, uh, currently in CESM, we have finite volume, cube sphere, uh, model uh, for prediction across scales, that's the atmos MPAS atmosphere, and spectral element dynamical cores. And we would like to essentially choose one of these uh, for the workhorse model of the uh, configuration of the uh, model. It doesn't mean that other, uh, uh, other dynamical cores will be eliminated. They'll be carried, upon, uh, carried forward, but the, uh, the workhorse model version will be using whatever we choose uh, uh, for uh, going forward. And uh, it, Again, the target applications uh, are uh, for the next generation, one degree version of the uh, CESM. And this is a rather lengthy process. It involves multiple uh, sort of uh, levels of evaluation or multiple phases. In phase one, uh, inherent properties of the dynamical core uh, that includes computational performance, tracer transport characteristics, energy and momentum conservation, uh, were, com uh, were considered, and this phase is uh, completed. Uh, phase two will involve general performance under comprehensive AMIP type simulations, that's atmosphere only. This is about to start. And then in the next phases, which will go into three, four, five, we'll be considering individually uh, coupled uh, climate, uh, inclusion of chemistry climate, and then paleoclimate applications. And this effort is led by Peter Loritsen and Isla Simpson from CGD. And we are, we are actually forming uh, several uh, sort of teams. We have the dynamical core task team. Then we will have an assessment panel. Uh, they will all report to the uh, CSM scientific steering committee that I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, which will have the decision-making authority uh, in this case. And of course, stakeholders, meaning that the developers of FV, MPAS, and AC DICORS are uh, all involved in this process. Finally, uh, uh, this is the last slide. Uh, we are uh, also uh, working on bringing uh, mo modular ocean model version six, that's MOM6, into the CESM3 uh, framework. Uh, we are currently conducting uh, many simulations to gain experience and intuition for model sensitivities especially with vertical discretization and coordinate options. And this is uh, led by uh, Gustavo Marquez. And this is just showing an example here, considering Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, AMOP. The left panel is uh, from a Z coordinate or level coordinate simulation. Uh, the right panel is from a hybrid vertical coordinate simulation. They both use 75 vertical levels or layers. And you can see that the representation AMOC, particularly its strength, uh, seems to be quite sensitive to what you do with your uh, coordinate system. And that's uh, what we are trying to understand before we make this model version available, fully available to the community. As I said, though, it has been released as a functional uh, option in CSM 2.2. And with that, uh, I will take uh, questions. By the way, uh, this lower uh, panel is essentially showing the uh, 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 showing a MOM6 simulation, uh, showing the velocity uh, field at high resolution. This is, I think, uh, order 10th uh, of a degree uh, simulation. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Gokhan. Any questions for Gokhan? There is one. Uh, is it how we pronounce it, Jordan? Yeah, it's Jordan. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, Jordan. Yeah. 
Uh, Gokan, thank you for that uh, great uh, comprehensive talk. I just wanted to, um, to ask about uh, the climate diagnostic and variability package. Uh, I, I think that's the one that's usually um, sort of the flagship for CESM. And you've mentioned the climate model analysis tool. Have you compared them? Uh, do they give similar results or different results that might uh, help with choosing which one to use? Oh, you mean uh, which one to use between the climate modeling, uh, sorry, CVDP, uh, uh, climate variability and change diagnostic package versus the CMAP tool? Is that what you're asking? Right, yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, so, uh, one issue right now with the CMAP, CMAP package is that it is still uh, not ready for prime time. It needs to be generalized. It is at this point uh, just very specific and only one or two people at this point, maybe one person, John Fasulo, can actually use that thing. Uh, the other people still need quite a bit of help. And we are aware of the situation and we are trying to make that thing uh, available uh, to the public, but that'll require some resources and trying to figure out how to do that. In contrast, the uh, climate variability and change diagnostic package is already available and it's very user friendly. We know that in, uh, so, but they're, uh, keep in mind that they're uh, sort of targeting different applications as well. One is more on the side of sort of evaluation of the model mean state and annual or seasonal cycle uh, of variability. Whereas the other one essentially comparing, it's more, much more comprehensive and comparing uh, variability in an ensemble sense, both inter and intra model comparisons are available. So at this point, I would still encourage use of climate variability and di uh, change diagnostic package. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? And you, you, if you have any other questions, you can just uh, send me an email. Uh, my, e user, uh, my email address is my first name at ucar.edu. And it's also available from the CSM website as well. And this presentation should be available. I sent it yesterday, I think, to Gustavo and Elizabeth. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll post it later today and uh, the recording will also be available later today. Well, thank you very much again, Gokan. Okay. And uh, if there are no questions either to Gokan or myself re regarding the week, 